Hello everyone, my name is Shaylin Ameo and I'm the Public Engagement Manager for Connecticut Landmarks. I will be your moderator today. We are using the webinar setup of Zoom, so you do not need to worry about muting yourself or turning your camera off. If you would like to submit a question for our speaker, please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your window. If you need assistance, you can select my name, CTL Shaylin, in the chat feature. Connecticut Landmarks is a statewide network of historic house museums that shares 400 years of New England history. We use our historic properties to inspire an understanding of our complex past to help create a state whose people move forward together as one. Today's program is part of our Landmarks Lunch and Learn virtual lecture series presented the second Wednesday of each month, June to November at noon. Make deeper connections to the history of our people, buildings, and landmarks with this series. See the full lineup on our website, ctlandmarks.org, and at the link that I am about to drop in the chat. Today's program focuses on the Butler McCook House and Garden, located in Hartford. From 1865 to 1927, Reverend John James McCook spent his days on East Hartford's Main Street as the pastor of St. John's Episcopal Church and his evenings on Hartford's Main Street as the patriarch of the Butler McCook family. Today, we'll learn about his life, his work at the Edward Tuckerman Potter Design Church, and his family's continued connection to the parish. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Jana Colasina is the Assistant Site Administrator for Connecticut Landmarks North Central Region, which includes our Hartford and Suffield sites. She is an enthusiastic advocate for Hartford history. Depending on the day, you can find her leading walking tours of the city or welcoming visitors to performances by local musicians and artists. In fact, tomorrow evening is the latest entry in our Sunset Sounds concert series with Nicole Zoraitis performing at 6 p.m. in the garden at the Butler McCook House. For more information, visit our website, ctlandmarks.org. And without further ado, here's Jana. Thank you, Shaylin. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you uh, and get our Lunch and Learn started. Uh, I wanna share some of the interesting stories of the McCooks, not only on Hartford's Main Street, but on East Hartford's Main Street as well. Uh, as Shaylin mentioned from 1865 until 1927, that was the year of his death, Reverend John James McCook was a presence on East Hartford's Main Street as much as the family was on Hartford's Main Street. So uh, my goals in this Lunch and Learn today are to introduce you to Reverend McCook in a little more depth than you might hear uh, inside the McCook House, where there are so many family members' stories vying for attention, along with uh, such great items in our collection that we don't really get to focus on him, uh, and introduce you to the family members uh, as well, who were present on East Hartford's Main Street and Hartford's Main Street. And I want to acquaint you uh, with the history of the beautiful church on East Hartford's Main Street, St. John's Episcopal Church, which uh, Reverend McCook was integral in helping to build. Uh, so first I'd like to talk about uh, the founding of the church. Here is Reverend McCook, um, his birth and death dates, 1843 to 1927. Uh, he was born in Southern Ohio and he moved to Hartford in 1865. So really it was his full lifetime uh, spent with St. John's Parish and on uh, Main Street at the Butler McCook House. He came to Hartford to attend Trinity College. And if you aren't aware, Trinity was located where the state capital is today, between the site of the Bushnell and the Connecticut State Capitol. And if you've uh, been to the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch, it is on Trinity Street. And that street is so named because that's where the college was. And Trinity was the scholastic, um, it was the place where the scholastic and theological focus was uh, on the area's Episcopalian outreach programs. 
So this, this was a place where Episcopalian ministers were trained versus Yale, where they were training Congregationalist ministers uh, down at Yale uh, College at the time. And digging back into the history of Trinity College, we know that they were sending students out uh, to preach outside of the Hartford area, uh, doing uh, work expanding their reach uh, and preaching in East Hartford as early as 1842 to 1843. We know definitively there were two Trinity College students, Alfred Goodrich and a Mr. Leffingwell, who in 1852 were headed to preach in Manchester when they encountered a small Methodist church at Larrabee Street and Burnside Avenue uh, in East Hartford that was temporarily unused. And they believed it was a good spot for a mission. This would be an Episcopal mission across the river uh, in East Hartford. And so they got a loan of this building and set to work, uh, founding a what would begin uh, the congregation of St. John's over there. However, in December of 1853, that mission was already displaced on account of the fact that the Methodist church objected to the Christmas greenery that the Episcopalians were displaying in the building. So then uh, this mission church began to meet in a private home, later a schoolhouse, and then a small chapel on Forbes Street, which was south of the Hockenham Bridge. Uh, so here is St. John's Episcopal Church from a historic postcard. And the parish itself was formally uh, organized as Grace Church in 1854. So that was that early parish that was meeting beyond uh, the Methodist building. And we know that there were a number of figures in East Hartford. Uh, James Goodwin notes this in his book, East Hartford, Its History and Tradition, uh, naming a few men who formed Grace Church, a Protestant Episcopal society, and quote, fitted up a little chapel south of Mr. Easton's house in Scotland, now Burnside, using for this purpose the frame of the old ancestral Easton house. And they met there for a while, and then afterwards meeting were, meetings were held on Main Street in Elm Hall. It was about 10 years later, in May of 1863, that the building became known as St. John's Chapel. And St. John's Church uh, was formally founded in 1867. And this building that you see on the screen was dedicated in June on the 22nd in 1869. And this church is, is uh, described as the substantial stone church of this parish on Main Street was erected through the instrumentality of Mr. John James McCook, its present pastor. It was begun in 1867. And that again is from Goodwin's history, uh, which is really the seminal history of East Hartford and uh, the numerous inclusions of McCook in there suggest how important he is to the town. Uh, so this brownstone landmark on Main Street was a monument to the Gothic style in the Victorian age, and it was designed by the leading Episcopalian church architect of the time, Edward Tuckerman Potter. And you may be familiar with Potter's name because he was also the architect of uh, the Church of the Good Shepherd and the Mark Twain House. Uh, so he worked for both Elizabeth Jarvis Colt and Mark Twain. Potter began his career as an architect working as a draftsman in the office of Richard Upjohn. And Upjohn happened to be the most prolific practitioner of the Gothic revival in the United States. He followed the English Gothic tradition and it was Upjohn's son, Richard M. Upjohn, who designed the Connecticut State Capitol, which we'll look at later. Um, and it was there in this office that Potter first learned about church architecture. Uh, he was also a known devotee to the writings of John Ruskin. 
So this is the church building uh, in East Hartford built by Potter, and it was completed, as I mentioned, in 1869. The budget we know for the church was very small. Supposedly, only $5,000 uh, were authorized, but I have yet to find out what the actual church budget is. Um, this is a parish that was merged with St. John's and Vernon as their congregation uh, grew very small. And a few years back, I went to look through their records, but I didn't find any uh, budget records included for the actual building of this site. Uh, as a point of comparison, St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church, which was just a couple blocks down from the Butler McCook House, built on Main Street in Hartford, and they laid their cornerstone at approximately the same time as St. John's, had a budget of $150,000. And it overran its budget to a, to the tune of $200,000. Uh, the one thing I will mention is that St. Peter's Parish was 180 by 80 feet in size and was one of the largest churches in the state of Connecticut. And by comparison, this little jewel of a church on Main Street in East Hartford was 34 feet by 80 feet. Um, and... As a point of reference uh, for the pr prices of building those buildings, the average daily pay for laborers at that time was $2.20. So even $5,000 was a large expense, but I think $150,000 was astronomical. Um, one way they may have shaved some money off the budget, uh, if you look, these are two different churches designed by Edward Tuckerman Potter uh, within a couple years of each other. On the left is Grace Episcopal Church in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which was built in 1865, and then St. John's, which was begun in 1867. And they're nearly identical with Grace Episcopal being out of built out of brick, whereas St. John's is Portland Brownstone. Um, but such similarity between churches was not unusual for prominent architects. And this was one thing that helped keep uh, costs down for parishes and meet their budget constraints. Uh, importantly, uh, St. John's Episcopal Church was the first church in the area that had free seating, which meant that parishioners did not have to purchase seating rights. And I wanna just give you a point of comparison for some different types of church architecture. Um, I mentioned that St. John's is built out of Portland Brownstone. And here on the left, you would see uh, the first congregational church of East Hartford, which not unlike the congregational churches on Main Street in Hartford uh, was predominantly uh, white, clabbered, uh, built in the classical, classical revival style uh, with a large steeple. Um, and you see on the right, Christ Church Cathedral, which is the Episcopalian church on Main Street in Hartford, just across the street from the G. Fox building. And this was uh, a building that took quite a different uh, direction on purpose. Whereas the uh, church, the Anglican Church or the Episcopalians wanted to differentiate their buildings from congregational churches once they finally had the right to build uh, again after the revolution and reclaimed their land as uh, the Christ Church Parish had to do uh, in Hartford. And this is a building designed by Ethiel Town, and it's one of the earliest Gothic revival churches perhaps buildings in the entire country. Um, so these churches are early 19th century. And then here is that pinnacle of the high Gothic in Connecticut, uh, the state capitol, which is designed by Richard M. Upjohn, uh, who probably was working in his father's studio as well uh, at the same time Potter was there. Um, and then you see here, Church of the Good Shepherd, which is the pinnacle, pinnacle of high Gothic, high Victorian Gothic for uh, a church building. And you see uh, 
what sets it apart is that they have, you can see all the coloration on the church in the stonework and in the slate uh, and tiles on the roof. Uh, that polychrome finish really is a distinction of this high Gothic style. Um, the contrast in colors and textures uh, make it different from earlier buildings. So this was a building that was commissioned by Elizabeth Jarvis Colt. And I had often speculated that this church came first and that while Potter was in the area, he was able to take the commission and build St. John's. However, interestingly, it was St. John's Parish in East Hartford, which came first. Uh, we know that Mrs. Colt moved uh, in the high Episcopal society in New York City. And she knew the major church architects and their buildings through moving in those circles. Um, and we know that Edward Tuckerman Potter was also uh, part of that same Episcopal hierarchy. Both his father and his uncle were bishops in the Episcopal church and his brothers were ministers. And so they would have been moving in the same circles in New York. Uh, and it was toward 1866, she chose Edward Tuckerman Potter uh, for this commission, perhaps having been favorably impressed by his plans for St. John's Parish and whose cornerstone was laid months before Church of the Good Shepherd. So uh, an area that I'd like to dig into a little further in the future would be to find out the nature of the connection between Potter and McCook. Um, both of these churches were constructed in the 1867 to 1869 timeframe, and perhaps Potter's availability for St. John's was dependent on having this more important commission in Hartford. Um, but Potter had a very um, interesting and continued connection to St. John's Church. We know that when he was in the Hartford area, he attended services over in East Hartford at St. John's, and he even went so far as to sing with them in the choir, which to me suggests a rather friendly connection with John James McCook uh, that I think would be interesting to further explore. Uh, so here again, we see St. John's Episcopal Church. It is also in this high Victorian Gothic style, and the characteristics of that style are the high gabled roof that you see, uh, which is covered in multicolored slate, the five Gothic lancet windows uh, at the end of the nave that are across the front or the west elevation of the church that are graduated in height, and also this projecting entrance tower, which we see uh, to the right of the main block of the building. It was in the southwest corner of the church, and it's almost freestanding. It has an open belfry, a trumpet spire, and also a weather vane finial, which uh, unfortunately is cropped off in this picture. There are also heavy wooden double doors on three sides around that entrance tower. Um, I have read, and I'm not quite sure I believe it, that Potter designed this church with a specific tribute to Reverend McCook. Um, it's been described as having these ups upswept pagoda-like edges along the ends of the roof line and the bell tower, and that there was an Eastern cast, uh, in quotations, to the decoration that reflected McCook's love of travel and interest in Asia. And I'm not contesting that he had those interests, but I am wondering at this early point in his life and career, whether this is uh, really the case. This was be this church was begun so soon uh, after his graduation from divinity school and uh, after his marriage to his wife that I don't think he had the time at this point to have developed those interests uh, for this to really be the case. Here is a black and white interior shot of this church. Um, 
And we know that Edward Tuckerman Potter was said to have a particular affection for St. John's. He particularly loved uh, the star dotted ceiling. I hope you can see in the uppermost corners of this image, um, the frescoed walls of this church and the illuminated chancel arch. The interior of the church is well lighted by windows. Um, there's a central aisle with oak pews on either side. And as I mentioned, the high ceiling is decorated with gold stars. Most of the decorative interest is concentrated in and around the chancel arch that we see here. Uh, and then with trefoil arches repeated in the oak woodwork. There's also extensive stenciling that surrounds the east windows and organ pipes uh, of the church as well. And unfortunately, I don't have a good photograph of that. In Potter's biography, uh, his biographer says, quote, St. John's in East Hartford is the most charming of Potter's smaller churches. By advanced English standards of the 1850s and early 60s, Potter's work may seem timid, yet in many particulars, such as the doorway, it rivals the best English work of the period. So that is a pretty, uh, pretty decent amount of praise for this small little church. And uh, I wanted to draw people's attention to it. You may be more familiar with this residential architectural commission of Potter's. This is the Mark Twain House in Hartford, and it was begun in 1874. So this is an example of Potter's residential architecture. And uh, from there, I want to talk a little bit more about how Reverend McCook expanded St. John's Church and its grounds. Uh, in 1906, the church expanded with the purchase of property adjacent uh, on the corner of Burnside and Main Street. So up, excuse me, up near the top, you see Burnside Avenue and Main Street would be running along uh, the left side of the image. And this property that purchased, that they purchased had a colonial home, which was used as a parish house and you can uh, imagine the McCooks did not use that building as a parish house uh, because they were living on Main Street in Hartford in the Butler McCook house. And this parish house remained on the grounds of St. John's until May of 1970. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but the church, and you can see the parish house in this image in the lower left-hand side uh, of this church image. And this was a property that was purchased from Eliza Sheldon Butler McCook. So this was Reverend McCook's wife who actually owned this building. And I don't know if church uh, finances didn't allow for the purchase at an earlier time and Eliza was able to step in and purchase uh, this building for the parish. But by 1906, they were able to purchase the parish house property from Eliza. And this was a late 18th century building along Main Street in East Hartford that you can see here. It was known as the rectory and an early issue of Connecticut Landmarks uh, Antiquarian Magazine, which was a publication of our organization, uh, discusses this parish house and how the late 18th century portico was supposedly saved by the Antiquarian and Landmark Society as a fine example of Connecticut River Valley craftsmanship. And it notes in the text of the article that this portico is stored in the Phelps Hathaway barn up in Suffield. And uh, as my colleague Lynn uh, would laugh, there are many things stored in that barn. So at some point we may have to go uh, looking for this portico. It may be one of many things there. Uh, sadly, this building was torn down and after 1970 no longer served as the parish house. Another building on the site of St. John's Episcopal Church, which you see also to the left here in the back, a little bit obscured by the tree, is Corning Hall. And this is a one-story church hall uh, on the grounds of the parish 
and it was constructed in 1912 of early concrete block building material uh, to simulate brownstones so it blended in with the church building and it was donated by the parishioner Mary Isabel Corning. What's of note about this church is that it had a basketball court on its main floor and it was the first athletic building in the town of East Hartford and this was significant because many uh, outside of the parish were able to use this building and the basketball court inside. And that's noted uh, in the second volume of East Hartford's history by Lee Paquette, only more so. And this building was given as a gift to St. John's Parish. And here is another view of St. John's Corning Hall here uh, to the back on Main Street. So that's a little bit of information about the parish and the buildings there and uh, Potter's work. Now I'd like to turn and delve a little bit more into the life of Reverend John James McCook. Uh, he was born on February 2nd in 1843 in New Lisbon, Ohio, which is in the southeastern part of the state. And if you've been on a tour of the house, you would have heard that he was only 18 years old when the Civil War began in 1861. And little Johnny, or JJ, as he was known in the family, was the youngest member of the so-called Tribe of John. And he was from a family known as the Fighting McCooks. And their uh, distinction was to be the family which had the most men fight for the Union in the Civil War. So his father, his brothers, and himself made up the tribe of John, and his uncle Dan and Dan's sons made up the tribe of Dan. When little Johnny enlisted, the, the war was barely a month old at the time. And so he had to bring his own clothing and supplies from home. His father, John McCook, gave him a small pocket pistol, which was not standard issue, and later, later sent him this sword, which you see in the photograph of McCook in uniform, but also if you tour the house, it is in the north parlor of the house. And this sword was made by the Ames Sword Company in Chicopee, Massachusetts. And it is the one that he's holding in the, holding in the photograph. Uh, what's interesting, is that since volunteer quotas for Ohio were already full, Johnny had to travel across state lines to enlist in the Western Virginia Volunteer Regiment. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the first Virginia company of volunteers. And this often throws visitors off because they would believe that if Virginia seceded for the Union, how could he have fought for the Union for Virginia? Um, so even though Virginia had officially joined the Confederacy, people who lived in its Western counties remained loyal to the Union cause and sent troops to support the United States Army. And you can see these are pre-1863 Virginia maps. And in the map on the right with that red dividing line, that shows the counties that split off in Northwestern Virginia to become the state of West Virginia in 1863. Um, so it's important to note that President Lincoln excluded 39 counties in Western Virginia when he defined, quote, insurrectionary districts on July 1st of 1862. And so that border seen in the right, the map on the right um, is those excluded Western Virginia counties. Like many of the early Civil War volunteers, McCook thought the war would be over very quickly, and he only signed up for a three-month enlistment. However, after his full three-month term was served, he decided that he was better suited to the life of a student than a soldier, and he enrolled at Trinity College here in Hartford. Now, McCook had been enrolled in college before he enlisted in the war, uh, trying his hand at medicine and law and not getting very far. Uh, so I suspect it was his cousin, Mary Sheldon, who invited him here to live at the McCook house uh, with Sheldon and her half-sister, Eliza Butler. And I do believe that she was 
looking to set these two up, Eliza, her half sister, and JJ McCook, her cousin, through her father's side of the family. And so he came to Hartford. He boarded with his cousins while he was attending classes at Trinity, which would have been just down the street from the Butler McCook house. And after graduating in 1863, he attended Berkeley Divinity School in Middletown uh, to further his education for becoming an Episcopalian minister. And having spent so much time together during the war years, John and Eliza, uh, Shel Eliza Sheldon Butler grew very fond of each other. And in 1865, John proposed to Eliza in the front south parlor of the Butler McCook house. And they married on June 7th, 1866. So roughly the dates of his marriage to Eliza coincide uh, with the years he served as the pastor of St. John's Episcopal Church. And here I'll show you, uh, this is Reverend McCook, his wife, Eliza Butler McCook, and their seven children from around 1889. They had four boys and three girls born between 1867 and 1882. Uh, and if you've been to the house, you know that the family was quite vigorous and very active, not only in the community, but outdoors as well. Um, so that's a bit about his family. I want to tell you a little bit more about his work uh, at St. John's. He served St. John's for over 60 years, from 1865 until his death in 1927. Uh, he helped organize St. John's Parish in 1865, he was ordained a deacon there in 1866 and became a rector there also in 1866. And in his diaries, it's interesting to read, uh, he was being hoarded, I think there's no better word for it, uh, by both Christ Church Cathedral, the main Episcopalian church in Hartford, and St. John's. Um, and he was going back and forth, meeting with the leaders of, of both parishes. And he ended up being ultimately won over by the East Hartford Parish. And when he was newly ordained on March 12th of 1866, he took charge of the young St. John's Parish. And for the next 60 plus years, he served and shaped East Hartford's Episcopal community, despite many offers to tempt him away by other uh, bigger and more prestigious posts. Um, and from what we understand at the Butler McCook House, this was a voluntary position without salary. And I know that Christ Church Cathedral was offering him a salary of at least $500 per year. So it certainly wasn't money that took him uh, to East Hartford. Additionally, uh, in 1883, Reverend McCook joined the faculty at Trinity College as a Latin instructor. So he did that in addition to his uh, parish duties, and later he became a full professor of modern languages at Trinity until his retirement in 1923. Um, so here are a few of uh, the important dates from his participation at the parish. Um, so he was there from the beginning organizing St. John's, um, ordained there, became the rector, and from the beginning was there with the building of the church, its completion, and then the expansion uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, what's interesting, he shows up in the history of East Hartford as well. One of the significant buildings also on Main Street in East Hartford is the Raymond Library. And this was a building that opened in 1889, and it is noted that he attended this gala opening of the library and was one of the speakers uh, for the program for this event, uh, note, noting his importance to the East Hartford community. And here you see uh, three of the McCooks, Reverend McCook to the right, his wife Eliza in the center, and then their son, eldest son, John, who was a doctor, which I can imagine is why he's there at the table with the skull, seated at their library table, which is still uh, in the house today. And there are many 
many parts of the house that tell the story of his participation in East Hartford community life as well as Hartford community life. Um, up in the parents' bedroom on the second floor of the Butler McCook house is this music box. And this was a gift given to Reverend McCook by his parishioners as a Christmas gift in the year of 1892. It was a Swiss music box and it was from the entire congregation and it plays tunes on these cylinders which could be interchanged. Each cylinder had six tunes and you can see from the drawer below, there were multiple cylinders that could be changed. And I think uh, this speaks to the fondness of McCook uh, by, uh, by his parishioners. And this is also noted in Lee Paquette's history of East Hartford as well. Uh, here's a quote from that book, only more so. The beloved Reverend Dr. John James McCook began service as a rector of St. John's in 1866 and was to serve the church and the town in a remarkable career for over 60 years. Dr. McCook was also a professor of languages at Trinity College for 40 years. And in the 1890s, he wrote a monumental study of Hartford's public charity. His investigations into the lifestyle of tramps made him a nationally known authority on poverty, tramps, and social problems. In fact, on one biographical data sheet, Reverend McCook personally listed his occupations as the following, and he numbered them. One, clergyman. Two, teacher. Three, investigator of so-called sociological phenomena and writer concerning them. And four, beggar general for Trinity College, which is important as he was integral to starting the endowment of Trinity College uh, there. So one of the things Lee Paquette mentions in his discussion of McCook is his study of so-called tramps, which began in 1890. Um, and this began when he objected to the amount of money the city of Hartford was spending on alms for the poor. And he was urged by the mayor uh, to chair a committee to investigate the expenditure of city funds for paupers. And McCook at the time thought these were able-bodied men and they should be working and not receiving handouts from the city. Um, and so after completing the 1891 alms report, McCook continued collecting and analyzing statistic materials on so-called tramps. So during his research, he explored the streets of Hartford and personally talked to many, quote, street people. Between the years of 1893 and 1895, he also oversaw the photographing of tramps as part of his research. And he used these photographs for illustrating his lectures and articles of which there are many. And he created three different series of photographs. The first was individual and group portraits of tramps from Hartford who were paid a quarter to be photographed at the Hartford studio of Charles Stewart. The second set of photographs were professionally done by photo, uh, photographers who accompanied him to saloons, police stations, and lodging houses in New York City, Boston, and Hartford. And then the third set of photographs were staged Hartford scenes that were photographed uh, by his second oldest son, Philip. Uh, to learn about this topic, McCook surveyed, dogged, and interviewed over 1,400 of these so-called tramps with interest in their physical health, their travels, and their habits. Among the things he did was conduct chemical tests on their liquor. He ate mulligan stew with them. He noted their various haunts and hangouts, and he also plotted maps of their journeys. One of the connections McCook made was to link the allure of vagabond life to the growth of the railroad in the United States, because by the end of the 19th century, there were close to 2,000 miles, or excuse me, 200,000 miles of track reaching almost every county in the United States. So the railroad and uh, this vagabond life were definitely intertwined. What's interesting is that his research disproved his theory that the city was spending too much money on the so-called tramp problem. 
What he did discover was that this issue was very complex and that these men were real people who needed help. And the results of these sur the, his surveys, excuse me, were sent to social agencies in 41 American cities. We know that McCook wrote and lectured on this subject from 1892 to 1924. His study results were used nationwide for dealing uh, with this so-called tramp problem because they presented statistical and anecdotal information about the difficulties faced by tramps. And he drew the relation between uh, these so-called tramps and the economic panics and labor strikes. And he showed that single men and alcoholics were the first fired in the 1873 financial crash and depression. McCook calculated that there were about 50,000 wanderers, many of whom were tradesmen or artisans in fields such as weaving, shoemaking, stone cutting, machinists, and masons that most of these men were under the age of 40, 5% were even under the age of 20, and that most of them were white Northerners and overwhelmingly alcoholic, and surprisingly, 90% of these men were literate. So uh, these were this was really significant work that McCook undertook in addition to his two other jobs. He was one of the earliest investigators uh, in this nation to tie a scientific link between alcoholism and social problems. Uh, Jacob Rees was another one of those early investigators. But this research came out of really literally trying to fix a problem in his own backyard. And it led to this very significant study today uh, all of his research is on microfilm down at Yale University. And he created a model for studying a national problem that remains in use today. Uh, without a doubt, there are criticisms of Reverend McCook's model, but regardless of the study's shortfalls, his work made a very positive impact on how we understand and respond to the issue of homelessness, homelessness and other social issues today. Uh, he went so far as to draft a bill recommending the establishment of a state reformatory for the rehabilitation of these so-called tramps and habitual drunkards. And although preliminarily the bill passed, it faced serious objections from both local residents and legislators, and thus the Reformatory Act of 1895 was repealed in 1897. Um, What's interesting is that McCook stepped away somewhat from his duties at St. John's when they hired an assistant rector, James Lord, in 1907. So this also would have coincided uh, with the purchase of that colonial home as a parish house for St. John's as well. And this was that same period when he took off on a nearly year-long around-the-world trip with his daughter, Frances. Uh, so here is a portrait of Reverend John James McCook, which is in the house on the second floor today. He received an honorary doctor of laws from his alma mater and workplace, Trinity College, in 1910. Um, there are a few things around the house uh, which are tributes to McCook. This is one that I find particularly touching and I'm quite fond of. This is the groundhog lamp on a dresser in his bedroom uh, on the second floor of the house. And because he was born on February 2nd, Groundhog Day, his children commissioned this lamp from a firm in Meriden uh, to honor what they called their father, the great groundhog for his birthday in 1913. Uh, and here is Reverend McCook seated in the south parlor of the house in the 1920s. Uh, you may recognize some of the things. I can pick out photographs that are elsewhere in the house from this image, and that may even be the groundhog lamp uh, right next to him as a reading lamp by the side table uh, near the mantel. As I mentioned, uh, the McCooks would be up, or excuse me, south in Niantic along the shoreline at this time of year, 
Uh, they enjoyed a summer house in Niantic, Connecticut, uh, now named McCook Point. Uh, and you can see McCook seated on that point overlooking uh, the water there. Uh, this was a place that he and his family loved to visit and they spent uh, the summers from June through September there. Um, and McCook died on January 9th, 1927, shortly before his 84th birthday. Uh, as I mentioned, he had seven children and these children uh, were also known on both Main Street in Hartford and East Hartford as well. And I uh, just wanna uh, briefly mention four of these children lived in the house on Main Street in Hartford for almost the entirety of their lives. Francis, John, Lucy, and Anson seen in these pictures here uh, with the bench they dedicated for their mother's 100th birthday out back in the garden and then with their father in the 1920s in this image uh, after Eliza had passed away. Uh, the oldest son, John Butler McCook, was a doctor. His obituary lists him as a devoted member of St. John's Parish. Uh, he practiced in Hartford beginning in 1896 and the addition added on to the McCook House in 1897 and 1910 were to uh, create a doctor's office for him in the house. Um, he served in a medical capacity in the Spanish-American War and World War I, and he was prominent in the reorganization of the municipal hospital in Hartford, now known as McCook Hospital. Uh, the eldest daughter, Eliza McCook Roots, uh, graduated from Hartford Public High School with honors and then went on to teach English and French there. She also taught Sunday school uh, up until the time in 1899 at the age of 30 when she left Hartford for China to pursue missionary work. And when she was in China, she met another American, uh, Bishop Logan Roots, who was the Bishop of Hankow, China, and she and he spent the remainder of their lives in China, but their children and grandchildren were frequent uh, visitors to the Butler McCook House on Main Street in Hartford. Here you see Anson and Francis McCook at the organ uh, of the house in Niantic, and they continue their lifelong devotion to St. John's and their old homestead on Main Street until their death. Uh, the love of the parish for Francis and Anson is borne out in the many, many clippings uh, the parish of St. John's had saved in their archives from Hartford papers about the McCooks and their homestead. And still today, I run into many uh, parishioners from St. John's who still fondly remember uh, Anson and Francis. Anson died in uh, 1966 and Francis died in 1971. Here you see uh, an article about the church planning a reception for Anson. Um, he was quite a figure, very small, suffered many illnesses as a child, and he had the ironic nickname of Bo, uh, so-called for Jumbo the Elephant because he was so tiny. He was the valedictorian of his Trinity class in 1902 and then attended Harvard Law School. Uh, he returned to Hartford in 1907 and he practiced law with a couple firms here in Hartford, including uh, McCook, Kenyon and Boney where he was the first uh, with the firm. He also volunteered uh, for the 8th Regiment, Massachusetts Voluntary Militia uh, during World War I and was an infantry captain there. He ran for numerous offices in Hartford and the state, and he was also uh, the state treasurer for a time uh, and was the executive secretary for Governor Charles Templeton. Uh, you can see here in the center, he ran for Congress in 1934 on the Republican ticket, however, was defeated. And he was involved in many, many civic activities including the Hillstead Museum, the Horace Bushnell Memorial, and of course, the Antiquarian and Landmark Society. And he was a very, very active member of St. John's 
church, serving in many capacities for over 50 years, including as a vestryman, assistant treasurer, treasurer, senior warden, uh, many years over a parish delegate to diocesan conventions um, and uh, a representative of the Diocese of Connecticut at eight national conventions for over 40 years. And lastly, uh, I will close with uh, Francis McCook, who was the last McCook family member to live in the house. She assumed the role of housekeeper uh, after her mother passed and managed the household for the family. We know she enjoyed music and acted as the substitute organist at her father's church. Uh, she also traveled extensively, and I mentioned that around the world trip she made with her father. And she took a very early interest in genealogy and history, eventually preparing notes and lectures about her family, their family's house, and the history of Hartford. And here you see Francis in front of the Amos Bull House, which now is Connecticut Landmark Central Office. She was integral uh, to saving that house and allowing it to be placed at the back end of her family's property, which unfortunately she never saw realized as she passed away uh, earlier in 1971 and the building was moved uh, in October of 1971. And you can see uh, Francis's obituary people in uh, St. John's Parish were quite saddened uh, by her death and there are many tributes to her in that parish. Uh, and so here I will go ahead and close and I'm happy to take any questions about uh, the McCooks and their activities on Main Street in Hartford and in East Hartford. All right, thank you so much for this wonderful examination of a couple of really amazing properties associated with one of our favorite families here at Connecticut Landmarks. Um, we do have a couple of questions. I know we're a little bit short on time, so uh, if anyone needs to jump off, no harm, uh, and we will be sharing the link of the recording. Um, so one of the questions is, do any pictures remain of the McCook House in Niantic? Which is, this is a timely question, correct? <laughs> Yeah, that is a great question. And in fact, there are many, many pictures uh, in our archives because um, the family, as I mentioned, you know, Philip helped Reverend McCook photograph for his uh, sociological investigation. I don't know who the main family photographer was, but there are oodles of, uh, I don't know whether to call them scrapbooks, but they're like memory boards where Francis has pasted many pictures from their summers there and they absolutely love spending time there and people today in Niantic still uh, remember the family but the house was a three-story house it sat up on a point and it was the state attempted to seize it to build a hospital for tuberculosis and I believe Anson fought off uh, the eminent domain seizure and then the family sold the property to the town of East Lyme for a very small amount because they wanted people to really enjoy the beautiful beach and the point, the upper uh, kind of a bluff where the house was built. The house itself had to be torn down. The town of East Lyme didn't know what to do with it uh, after they got the land from the McCooks in the late 1950s. But uh, the sidewalks around the house remain because Eliza was wheelchair bound late in life and so they put in uh, concrete sidewalks to make it easier to move Eliza around in the wheelchair and they also added an elevator to the house so she could continue to enjoy that spot so they were there from uh, 1870 when they built the house to the 1950s oh. so a long a long time there that's wonderful and then you can see a big panoramic view of the house and property over uh john and eliza's bed in the master bedroom oh <laughs> yeah um and then we have a couple other questions one of which is what how do you conduct research what are some of your favorite sources for this kind of local and personal information oh boy that's a great <laughs> question well one of the wonderful things about uh the mccook house is that francis was an absolutely phenomenal amateur historian and this family didn't throw anything away, or so it seems. 
And we have an incredibly deep archive for this family, unlike um, the Isham family, the other property uh, that I'm involved with in Hartford has kind of a dearth of material. So there's loads of uh, personal diaries, letters, and um, all sorts of sources to dig around in. In fact, uh, I could probably do a lot more. Much of this was just taken from different tour scripts that were written and histories of East Hartford and uh, the National Historic Register um, paperwork for adding St. John's uh, to, the, to the National uh, Historic Registry. And that church is no longer an Episcopalian church, but is still a church in East Hartford. It's been purchased uh, by a Ghanaian parish. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it lives on, right? It lives on, exactly. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, Jana. This was such a really wonderful talk, a great chance to kind of tie one of our properties to another site in Central Connecticut, which we always love to do. Um, and I just wanted to give, I wanted to thank everyone for attending today and also give one more plug for Sunset Sounds tomorrow evening at the Butler McCook House uh, in the garden. So you can come and see the site in person. It starts at 6 p.m. Um, and we are really looking forward to that. And also, if anyone is uh, really looking for another opportunity to uh, join a virtual lecture next Wednesday, we will actually be hosting another noontime talk about um, about uh, emancipation and uh, William Seward's uh, participation in the emancipation movement. So um, you can find details on our website, ctlandmarks.org. We will be sending out a recording and uh, thank you once again to Jana and to everyone who attended today for, for making this a really special hour. So thank you.